Well, good morning. I would like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the Joint Waste Disposal Board. Please note that the meeting is being broadcast and recorded. The board is, is together at Bracknell Forest Council with some officers joining online. Firstly, are there any apologies? No, none received, Chair. You can, you can see from the video feed that all members expected are present. The full text for declaration of interest is set out on the agenda at item four. If any member has a disclosable pecuniary interest or any affected interest to declare, please indicate and I will come to you in turn. No one? No. Thank you. There are no declarations, but may I remind everyone that you can make a declaration at any time should it occur to you at a later point. Anyone declaring a disclosable pecuniary interest will need to leave the meeting when we get to that relevant item. Right, so the next item to approve as a correct record, the minutes of the meeting of the board held on the 29th September, 22. Please indicate if you have any issues with the accuracy. Yes. Thank you, Chair. I thought it was, my apologies. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, page seven on the second full paragraph up. I found it really impossible to read that paragraph, certainly the first line, and would like that clarified as to what that actually was saying there. So it, there, on the first line, there is a drop off. Which, Reports which, could have full stop. Which paragraph? Um, um, page seven, the second full paragraph up. Beginning what? The board uh, beginning the board had previously asked to consider. So I just felt that sentence was entirely incomplete and I couldn't un really understand that paragraph and I thought it was important. Thank you. Sorry to be picky, Chair, but... We'll do the insertion and thank you for bringing that. Uh, Hannah's just mentioned that it wasn't your report that you... And clarify, if you can, please. Is that okay? We come back. Thank Any other notifications on this? No doubt we'll be covering the quite a bit of it when we go through the papers. Right. Oh, yes, we are now. Are there any matters arising from the minutes besides uh, what we mentioned? Nope. All right. The next item on the agenda is consideration any urgent items. Are there any? None notified. None notified at this point in time. As we go through. Yes, we're determining them. Right. Agenda item number five is a reused report and reused presentation from the contractor, FCC. Rory, Wren, please would you present the report and presentation. Thank you. Chem, while uh, Rory's getting his presentation, I'll just introduce Liam and Rory. Rory, you met at the last meeting. Liam is um, their uh, reuse manager or regional development manager, but with a specific focus here today on reuse and the purpose of the of the presentation is really to present to the board options for developing um, reuse in the RE3 area and I think I've filled now to the point where you're ready to go <laughs> yeah thank you Oliver um so yeah as you know um, I'm general manager for the RE3 partnership Liam as, as Olive said, works in, um, in our development team. So we're going to run for a joint presentation, just covering a few um, bits and pieces about what we do and what some potential future items are. So I'm going to hand over to Liam now, um, and he'll start the presentation. Thank you. Can, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this presentation. So I thought I'd, first of all, just take you through... Um, our YouGov poll results that we've, we commissioned last year in 2022 <coughs> where we surveyed over 
um, two pairs and adults to sort of set the scene for you in terms of how public appetite has shifted in reuse because um, we first did the survey back in 2020 so post pandemic it'll be good to see um, where public appetite has shifted to so next slide please Laura. Um, so in 2022 FCC surveyed over 2,000 adults to assess um, public appetite towards reuse um, the first question we asked in the survey was if you had access to a reuse shop at your local HWRC, had you purchased an item from it? To which 44% said they had. And sorry, this was in 2020. And then when we did the survey again in 2022, that had now risen by 12% up to 56%. So public appetite is clearly moving in the right direction for reuse and repair. Um, we, but we've clearly still got a long way to go. So in the, in the survey, um, we also, some, sort of, some key portion of the survey is that almost 80% agree that HWRCs should have a charity shop even nearby or on site. Almost three quarters of people who don't currently have access to a reuse shop said that they would donate, donate their items to one if a HWRC had one. And almost 60% of people said that they'd be more likely to donate than throw away their good quality second-hand items if they knew they would then be resold at a reuse shop. So in 2022, um, we also included a question around repair to see how public appetite had shifted in that direction. So we asked if, if they had a, a broken item, would they would they want to be able to go to their local HWRC and be shown how to fix it, or would they prefer to do that or, or than buy a new item? So 64% of respondents said that they would be keen to be shown how to fix their item, with just 19% said that they would prefer to buy new. Then we wanted to ask whether they believe that companies and local authorities should be encouraging consumers to repair their items, to which there was an overwhelming response in that 81% 81 of people said that they think they should be encouraged to fix their broken item rather than replace it, with just 4% saying that companies or local authorities should be encouraging people to buy new, which, given cost of living crisis and recession looming, would be consistent in that people want to protect their disposable incomes and repair items in the first instance. So finally, just some other pulls from the survey is that 75% of people do buy second-hand items. Almost half buy a second-hand item every six months. Almost half um, of people donate their items to a local charity shop every six months. And almost half visit their local HWRC at least once a year. So next, I just wanted to give you a flavour of how um, FCC operate reuse across the country. So we operate over 100 HWRCs across the UK. We currently have 10 physical reuse shops in operation, and we have seven smaller operations as well across the UK. So our 10 reuse shops, we partner with a third sector organisation on each of these um, because we believe that they are the retail experts, whereas we merely provide the feedstock for them. So we've currently got two shops in Suffolk, two in Buckinghamshire, one in Doncaster, one in Holland East Riding, one in North Warwickshire, which is Nuneaton, another in Wrexham, one in Neathport Talbot, and another one in Torvine. And we typically generate around £1.7 million pounds worth of revenue annually for our charity partners. We've also, in 2022, opened up a revolutionary reuse drop-off centre over in Swanton Road in Norwich. So that was a... That was a closed HWRC because the council opened two new sites, one in the north of the city, one in the south, which left Swanton Road, which is bang in the middle, as an FCC asset. And we decided to reopen that facility last year, but purely as a sort of merchant drop-off centre for the public to use because people were still turning up to the site as if it was a HWRC. So for convenience, we've opened it back up, but this time moving them in the direction of reuse on the hierarchy where they can only bring items that have got a potential second useful life in them and we've partnered with our charity partner who are the Benjamin Foundation who we work with over in Suffolk and Peterborough and they're also doing white good repairs at that site so any white goods that are deposited at the HWRCs in Suffolk are then collected and they're brought to Swanton Road where the Benjamin Foundation have put their staff through City and Gills training on how to repair fridges and washing machines we've got testing points available on site and they've repaired 
been repairing fridges since sort of June, July time last year, and that's generating another income stream as well. So it's been a real success story for FCC. Which is not right. Okay, so I'll just cover off what we currently do at RE3 as a bit of a reminder for everyone. So currently at the HWRCs, we collect um, furniture and bric-a-brac, and we donate some of that to Sue Ryder. So they collect certain items which um, they need to sell in their shops. They then sell them on um, and obviously get the, the money from those. We work with a local company called PreCycle where we scan the books that the members of public bring on to site. If they have a value to them, they are then uploaded online where people can buy them through platforms like Amazon and other things. And to put that in context, we scan in about 50 to 55,000 books a year. So quite a lot coming through. Um, and let's say and all of that brings in, in good revenue and, and obviously good for reuse. We also work with PreCycle on some bric-a-brac bikes and furniture and electrical items. They again take them and then they're distributed through various reuse networks. Um, we've operated two pop-up shops, um, one at Reading and one at Longshot Lane. Um, well that was the first for FCC as a business, um, was the one that we done last year at um, Reading. Um, really good events um, and all the money from that, all the, all the profit from that was donated to the Sue Ryder charity. And of course we also operate the repaint scheme where we collect water-based paints. Any tins that are full or nearly full and in good condition, they're set aside and then members of public can take them free of charge. Um, so why um, why does it matter? Why does reuse matter for, for FCC? Um, well, reuse sits under reduce at the top of the hierarchy, has the greatest um, carbon benefit of all the solutions for dealing with waste. In 2020, as a country, we reused 3.4 million furniture and electrical items, which is the equivalent to 111 tonnes of product and 123,000 tonnes of CO2. And crucially, by, by keeping these items in circulation, uh, means that the extra carbon emissions that are generated through producing new products are avoided. Um, and yeah, it, it, makes a, it makes a big difference to the world that we live in. In terms of different models of reuse that are available and models that, that, we, that we utilize as a business, so you can either have a physical shop or shops. They can either be on-site or off-site. So we have several across the UK that are actually physically on a HWRC. There are limitations with that because you need a site that's big enough to be able to locate a reuse shop with parking for the public to make it safe and, and usable. Or you can have a, have a shop off-site. So on the screen in the bottom right-hand picture, um, that's a, where, that's a, that's a <coughs> warehouse just off one of our HWRCs in South Wales, um, whereby the HWRC is located um, in close proximity. The items are collected and delivered to this shop, which is just slightly off-site but in an industrial unit and we partner with a local charity to run that on our behalf. You've also then got pop-up shops. So as Rory said, we've explored these already in Reading. We've done several events now. We've done, we've done a few events in partnership with the National Trust over in Buckinghamshire, within Suffolk, and we're, we're, we're looking to explore that further this year. Um, we've got the hub at Swanton Road, which I've talked about previously. So that's a different model altogether. Uh, that's potentially where the future lies, is having a facility where you can not only have a reuse shop, but also some sort of upcycling workshop where you can also do educational tours and visits for children and councils and wherever else may be. Um, and then we also look to partner with people like PreCycle. We look to do things like auctions where we'll have TVs in a shipping container. We'll welcome local traders who will come on and buy the, buy the um, TVs at an auction lot who will then take them into their local repair shops in the local town to repair them and sell them on. So there's loads of different models to explore for reuse, and these are the, these are the ones that we currently consider. So in terms of um, repair, touched on in the, in the YouGov poll, so as a business, we trialed these in 2022. We've only done two repair events so far. We, we did them both in Buckinghamshire. Um, the reason why we chose Buckinghamshire is because they already had uh, an established network of repair cafes across the county. We had an education and awareness manager that was um, located in Buckinghamshire who did a lot of good work in the community, so that's Gemma in the bottom right picture there. Um, we knew that through working with the council that Amersham was a town where they didn't currently have any repair cafes, so that was an area that we wanted to, to, to consider. So what we did is we, we hired a local church out for the morning on a Saturday 
paid them thirty pounds, had it from ten to one. Um, we did this. We've got so the two events. We had fifty five people participate with fifty four hours volunteered with thirty items repaired, fifty one kilo of waste presented prevented. Sorry, and uh, five hundred and forty two kilos of CO two. But the the real success story here is that we we've only we instigated it in Amersham, but the local community have carried on doing these ever since. So they've now got an established repair cafe in Amersham using the local church as their home. So it's been a real success story. And and why why have we considered repair? Well, because we believe that it builds on our existing reuse portfolio. At the time of writing this uh, last year, 230 councils had declared a climate emergency. So reuse and repair helps combat that. The Environment Bill required the Secretary of State to set legally binding targets, net zero emissions by 2050, and moving away from a, a linear model to one that's more circular. <coughs> and resource and waste strategy contains five strategic ambitions, which includes doubling resource productivity and eliminating avoidable wastes of, of all kinds. Okay, so Obviously, Liam's covered there a few few models that we we look at as a business elsewhere. But what next for for RE three? So we covered off what we currently do, and what we'll continue doing through this year while we develop a, an overall bigger solution. So obviously, we want to build on those commercial opportunities and deliver the increased social value that come with them. Um, so one of the things we're looking to is um, develop that solution in terms of collecting more items, um, and the more items that we collect through companies like PreCycle, etc. That, d that brings not only higher reuse, but obviously more revenue for the councils as well. Um, we'd like to continue delivering some pop-up events. Although these pop-up events are good, you know, they build public awareness and it does generate reuse. Um, by the time you take into account the costs and the effort, you know, there's not much of um, profit to come out of those. Um, but obviously they help sort of define what we want to do going forward and they get the public engaged. One of the things that we've looked at, um, essentially having a permanent shop, um, something to consider there, of course, is where would that shop be? So we'd have to consider things like land availability, planning and engineering support. Um, costs for building, obviously, shops can be quite expensive, um, particularly nowadays, the cost of building materials, etc. cetera. Um, or we could look at a shop off-site, potentially, you know, if there's a high street shop somewhere that's unused and we get a favorable rent. Um, ideally partnering with a charity um, the local charities work best for this because people see a genuine benefit to their community by working with a local company that they all know obviously one of the other th reasons working with the charity as Liam said they are the experts but people are more inclined to donate when they see that charity and equally then the you don't have to pay the VAT on the revenue so if it, that then equates to a good chunk of money that the charities can then benefit from locally as well um, you know, and one of the other things to, to look at with those is, you know, do we combine that or do we consider external repair, repair cafes, um, similar to the ones that we've operated in Buckinghamshire, you know, or do we look for the, what, where reuse is going now, even more in the future is this hub, which is potentially off site, but would include a shop repair cafe, you know, upcycling, um, a chance to work with local, um, third sector um, organizations to build skills etc um, so there's lots of options that we can look at there and what we'd really like to do is kind of push forward continue doing what we're doing but really build on that success and I suppose get a feel not necessarily at this meeting but afterwards you know what direction of travel that we'd, we'd like to go through as a partnership um, and that's kind of it any questions thank you um, before I send it out to part people who want to ask questions. I found this a very interesting paper. So much so I've held it back from giving it over to my other colleagues in the council because I know I'm going to be inundated by councillors who have already said to me about bicycle and could we not be giving them to foster parents and that sort of part about it. But this paper I was extremely interested in and will distribute it amongst my own councillors on it. And thank you. And I, I have visited the shop in the Vale of Gamorgan. Very impressed by the work that's being done there as well by FCC. I understand Peter Hayden has a question. Peter? So 
by the questions as written. People seem to be struggling because, in general, in generating £1.7 million worth of revenue, do we have any idea of the cost associated with generating it, or was that clear? Um, so, that £1.7 million was the revenue that was given to the charities. So, that was the charity yeah. revenue as part of the profit share. So, each um, facility, so whether that be a shop or a separate business, runs like an actual business. So, as a direct PL, so the costs are taken into account and the revenue, and then there's a profit share at the end of it. So we haven't got the, the exact costs for that, but um, you know each shop um, delivers you know a, a very reasonable amount of profit. No, that's, that's really good. It's uh, just on, just checking that it doesn't cost more to provide, but that sounds like a real success story. Well done. Thank you, Thank you Peter. I, and as I said, I was going to where, over the weekend send a report out to councillors, but I held this back because I, I'm going to send it today because I thought it such an interesting one. You may want to put your own uh, uh, words out to members that you attended this and what you felt about it as well. Are there any other questions? Yes, Councillor Harrison. Thank you, thank you. Um, we kicked off this presentation with, a, with an opinion poll of people asking them uh, what they thought about reusing and about recycling and so on. And the trouble with opinion polls is, of course, people don't always tell the truth, especially if they think they're being judged for their virtue on the answers that they give. So it's good to see that we've actually got some practical examples of things being done that can demonstrate to us what people will actually do if given the opportunity. So have we got any assessment of the possible size of the reuse market that we could scale up to? And at what point do you think that people's enthusiasm for taking part in that will translate from one-off events to the more permanent uh, fixtures such as the recycling shops and reuse shops and the repair shops? And at what level can that be sustained? Okay, so there's a couple of things there. So firstly obviously one of the big things you need to have a successful reuse shop is is the amount of feedstock so we, we know within the, the facilities within the re3 partnership we've got access to to enough tonnage to sustain one of those facilities through doing the pop-up events and engaging with the public at those events we know and through the tonnage that we're already reusing we know that there's good public demand and appetite within this area to, to continue reusing and to boost that even further so so we, we could go with a, a, a you know a good level of confidence that actually you know a, a shop or a facility has got all of the things required within this area to make it successful yes councillor tony page uh, <coughs> yep thanks for a very um Press it, yeah. So, um, yes, um, thanks. The questions I've got is, um, firstly, there's the use of existing um, charity networks and shops, which are obviously there um, and don't involve us in having to establish any um, new facility. Um, and I suppose it's how one goes down... Uh, that clearly makes a lot of sense, the VAT point you touched on, the fact that they are there and that people will engage with charity shops. I suppose it's how one takes that forward to the next stage in identifying potential partners and charities. We don't want to go through some sort of tendering uh, process. Um, we all have our networks with, uh, with the local voluntary sector, and I suppose I would like to see the extent to which in Reading, Bracknell and Wokingham there's an appetite from some of the local existing charity shops to engage <coughs> with this and that would be the sort of the first exercise because clearly it makes the best use of an existing facility. Um, and then the other point is of course a new facility and I presume you're talking about us establishing potentially some um, new facility. Now there's plenty of um, empty shop units in all our 
um, boroughs. Um, whether they're in the best location is, is debatable, but that does raise um, substantial issues around the resource that would be required by us individual officers, yourselves, in uh, establishing um, that. Um, and I would be minded initially to, to look at the former option to see what scope there is to work with local charities in that network, rather than going for sort of a new facility um, that, that has all that sort of resource implication for us as a, uh, an organization. And, and the final point on the subject of hub, and this specifically relates to something we're taking forward to in, in, in Reading and might be worth exploring once it's established. We, we've received um, funding to enable a uh, uh, safe bicycle storage facility to be opened in the centre of Reading under the Primark headquarters <coughs> in West Street. And that will be a unit that, that will offer potentially, well, it will in initially offer safe storage facilities. It's, it will be manned, um, personed, um, for 12 hours uh, a day and what we're looking for is uh, to get the local cycle campaigns and voluntary organisations involved in uh, looking at the potential for bicycle repair and bicycle sales and this is where the reuse element might um, fit into that. Now that hub will be opening in a few months time and we'll then be talking to organisations uh, about the, the expansion of that. So there may be a specific outlet in Reading where we could look um, to uh, channel um, bicycle um, or second-hand bicycles. And, and my final question to you is what volume of bicycles are we dealing with across the RE3 um, partnership? Are they mainly children? Because the photos show sort of smaller bikes, just children's uh, bikes. Um, but what proportion um, are sort of adult proper bikes, as I would call them, um, and are there the numbers that would potentially um, suggest that, that you know, working with a, a bicycle hub might uh, offer some potential in the future? So that was all for me. Thank you. Okay, so um, in no particular order. Um, so just picking up on the last point first, Predominantly, we do get mainly children's bicycles because adults tend to kind of hang on to theirs longer um, or, you know, pass down to a relative, whereas obviously a child's bike is normally only sort of the right size for about a year or so. So the proportion of adult bikes is, is a lot smaller. Um, however, you know, we do get some. I suppose, unfortunately, we don't get maybe fully completed items. We get kind of part bicycles. Again, you know, we're which is good because it means that the members of the public have already decided you know, to take bits off and reuse and make their own bikes and, and various things. Um, I think talking about the hub that you, you, you mentioned, we'd certainly be interested in exploring that option further with yourselves and obviously discussing that with Oliver and, and his team and how, how we could fit in with that and whether that's, that's something we could work with or expand upon. Um, so yeah, definitely interested in keeping an eye on that. And then in terms of the shops, so there's a couple of things. So when you when we talk about partnering with um, charities we don't always mean somebody who's already got an existing shop so we have done some work with charities that already have sort of established shops and normally what they find is they've got enough feedstock for that shop so that shop's kind of very self-sufficient only needs a little bit of topping up now and again so they're not really able to handle the volumes that we can produce and provide to them what we quite often do, um, if I'll hand over to Liam in a moment, but we we'll quite often work with a, a charity that say got a, a hospice in the area and will open a separate shop, a new shop, and touching on some of the points you made about um, you know, costing and, and the, the resource involved, the business model that we put together takes all of that into account. So it takes the capital costs, the building costs, or any refurbishment costs, and let's say, and they're operated then as a separate business so that we can then take those capital expenditures, take the, the revenue that comes in, the operating costs. So normally the charity will, will staff it, so their costs, you know, utilities, all of that sort of thing. Um, and then once you're left with the profit at the end, that's the money that's then split, which is where that, uh, that 1.7 million came from, that was out of that profit at the end. Um, but I don't know if Liam wants to add anything. 
Oh yeah, I just wanted to add to that in that it's it's space for a, for an existing um, charity shop in maybe on the high street. We, you've, if you've got all these TVs and electrical items, what we tend to do on our sites is we'll have a separate shipping container where they'll do pat testing. Then they'll have to function test things like TV. So it's 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 that if as that charity shop on the high street got the room to be able to take in these electrical items, pat test them, function test them, bicycles, test them. No, it's, it's it's space for testing as well as having space on the shelf to be able to sell these items. Yeah, Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, following along from uh, Councillor Page's kind of question. Um, and, and saying that we do have enough stock here, uh, I think it is something that is definitely uh, worth looking, and I, I would think that it would be, uh, I'd like to see uh, our partners kind of all uh, getting behind this, because uh, it, it does sit, as explained in the presentation, really at the very top of the waste hierarchy uh, to do something about this. So I think it would behoove all of us, uh, really, to, to get on this bandwagon, so to say. Uh, the 1.7 million that's been able to be generated back to charity partners, it almost seems to me that that a portion of that should be uh, looked at being allocated um, if, as we're able to go forward on this to actually doing some some real research so that so that for example the charity shops that are already in existence do not feel um, um, in competition with so to say were we to set up our own thing, and that, and, and that we're also protecting wonderful charities like Sue Ryder and all of that, who, who obviously uh, do a wonderful job. Um, but to kind of look at and, and have a bit of a focus as to how this could be our own niche. Uh, also to look at spaces. Um, you know, again, when it's furniture, you talked about uh, the fact that we would need parking facilities. Uh, so in other words, someone drives up a car, they need a big uh, armoire, something like that. So there's a lot of things to be thought about uh, in really taking us on board to do something, but I, I think we would be um, unwise not to actually, uh, I don't want this to sound bad, but in the middle of a cost of living crisis when this actually really, really means a lot um, to, uh, I don't want to call it an opportunity either, but it is, but it is uh, on some level to embed this kind of culture and this kind of ideology that um, someday when the economic lights do shine again, that we will have this embedded in our, in our uh, residents uh, to reuse first and, and to really propel us on. So it's a, it is an opportunity right now that I think we should take. So, so I, I would, partners, uh, want to see what we could do about taking some of that funding to do some meaningful work about researching. Thank you. Any other members? Well, I'm pleased that you've all uh, come on board with this because the word recycle, reuse is there. Also, having had councillors of my own um, borough come to me and say about the bike things, we've got an opportunity here and I really do think we should take it forward. Can I take it then everyone's in agreement with this and I would, I would Ask that you recycle, recycle, reset. You send it round. So send it round to your member, your other members. Get some of their input as well, so we can feed back to FCC and the officers. Because I think that's where we will make something. We will make something of this. And as I said, it's not going to be just um, us taking away from Sue Wright and the others. It is getting together and all working together. And climate change is there. Thank you. So therefore, I will take it that you will take that for one forward. Right, thank you. Then agenda item six is the RE3 progress report. Oliver, over to you, young man. Thanks, Chairman. I'm gonna hand straight over to Sarah and I'll um, go and have a quick chat with Rory and Liam on their way out and just say thanks and, and then we'll come back. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen, you were excellent, as always. Okay. Thank you. Are we ready to start on progress report? Yeah. 
Okay, um, so first thing on the report for, um, yeah, progress report was the user satisfaction survey. Um, so as you may be aware, we undertook the annual survey for the recycling centres at the end of last year. Um, as with the last couple of years, it was an online survey that residents completed after a visit to the sites. Um, and we let the survey run until we had a similar number of responses um, to the previous year for comparison purposes. Um, in terms of results, you will have seen from the report that at small mead, um, overall levels of satisfaction fell by 1% compared to the previous year, um, down to 90%. Um, and at Longshot Lane, it rose by 1% compared to last year, up to 89%. Um, so overall, very similar responses to what we saw last year and very similar responses between the two sites. Um, you've also got a further breakdown of other um, key responses within the report. Um, I suppose the key thing to point out is in relation to the booking system. Um, we asked the same questions to residents about the booking system as we did um, in the previous year. And the main area of difference was in relation to the number of people who said they found it hard to get a slot when they needed one. Um, and that decreased um, compared to last year. Um, are there any questions in regards to the survey? Any prior questions? Therefore, no, continue, no. please. Oh. We'll pin that for you. Oh, on the next, okay. Yeah, um, okay, so the next section is about the booking system. Um, so, um, yes, as you'll be aware, we've discussed the booking system at the recycling centres at the last couple of meetings, um, and various information has been presented. Um, at the last meeting, members decided that a decision about the retention of the booking system would be made at this meeting. Um, in the event that a booking system is retained, um, we've looked at a number of potential options um, that could be used to supplement our existing system, um, and these are detailed in the report. Um, so obviously the first one is about trying to minimise digital exclusion, particularly by introducing some language translations within the booking system. Um, the second one is about corporate surveys and using those to get more feedback from residents, particularly those ones who don't come to the recycling centres very often at the moment, um, and using that feedback to look for further areas of improvement. Um, we've also talked before about the potential for having periods during the week in which no bookings are required for the recycling centres. Um, but I think some members have noted that that could be quite confusing for residents um, and potentially a challenge to operate at the sites. Um, and lastly, um, there's also the option, of course, to review the numbers of bookings that we've got um, and see if we can accommodate some, some more slots at the recycling centres. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all I was planning to say in terms of the report, so I will hand over to members for discussion. I'm very aware that Councillor Page wishes to speak to this after Councillor Page. Yeah, um, thank, so, yeah, thank you uh, for that. Um, as you'll be aware, <coughs> and as we indicated at the last meeting, uh, quite a number of our new members and some of our uh, older members uh, raised a number of concerns um, about the booking system, and I'm grateful to Oliver um, and colleagues from RE3 uh, and council officers for arranging not one but two briefing sessions uh, for members, which was uh, very helpful. And you will be aware that I wrote to colleagues on the 30th of November with the upshot of um, the discussions um, that we had held um, internally. Um, I was a bit confused at the reporting in 5.13 where, where it was uh, sort of already as though a board had discussed these you know this option was welcomed by members of the re3 board and will be pursued i'm not too sure what board meeting that was uh, but uh, um it's uh, i mean i don't uh, disagree with the sentiments but um uh, certainly in item C on the top of page 35, um, there's a clear statement this option was not supported by members of the RE3 board. That was the issue of offering limited opening hours. 
and that is probably the area um, where there is still the strongest feeling amongst a number of members um, in Reading that, that this is something that, that uh, uh, should be uh, considered further, um, although we understand there are obviously uh, some issues that, that are mentioned um, here. Um, I think it's worth emphasising that overall there is uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, sympathy for the, for the retention of a booking system and the benefits that uh, produces, but the issue of digital exclusion that's referenced here is a serious one, and particularly an area uh, like Reading, which has the highest proportion of um, foreign languages spoken um, in Berkshire along with, with Slough, it is important with high turnover and with uh, linguistic challenges that, that our information is as up-to-date and, uh, um, and thorough as possible. And so um, that uh, obviously is, um, needs to be taken forward. Uh, the survey um, and, uh, is an interesting one because I think initially what we were saying was misunderstood. We're not saying that the current survey of users should in any way be modified or discontinued, far from it, it's very useful. I think the issue that was being raised and is one that, that is probably a wider one for consideration by our individual councils is the issue of those people that don't use the centres um, that for whatever reason, and we don't really know that, for obvious reasons, you can't survey people that aren't going to the centres. Um, and therefore, is there um, the potential in our wider corporate surveys that I think all three authorities do um, to ask people about their awareness of the centres and actually ask questions? You know, if you don't go there, why are you not going there? Is it because you've got nothing to take there or everything is dealt with through the domestic streams or whatever? So it, it's that um, issue of, and it, I suppose it goes to an exclusion point, um, is there more that we could be doing having got that information? Um, and that was the issue. So it wasn't in any way uh, to question the, the, the use of or the validity of the user survey. It's really a survey of non-users and how one gets a bit more information about how one could therefore um, improve the usage um, of, the, um, um, of the two centres. Um, so that's the really... The, the reference to corporate user satisfaction surveys, and uh, um, that's, uh, uh, but I think that's now um, understood. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's probably all that I, I know Karen wants to, uh, uh, to come in, but uh, um, it was just a bit confusing about the, the comments that were made in here as though they'd already been discussed, whereas, of course, with um, those comments from Reading only uh, were sent over at the uh, right. end of uh, uh, November. Thank you, Councillor Page. Before I go to Karen, I will ask Oliver to intercept on things, but I will mention the, the word corporate user satisfaction. The uh, uh, article or the agenda item we had prior on the shops might bring that in. If we, in the future, we were people that don't use the tip to take waste to, if we get the message out there that we are doing this recycling, reusing, that will bring it to the attention of local people as well. Oliver? Chairman, thank you. Yeah, at 5.13, really, just to, to answer that, um, as it says, following the RE3 board meeting in September, members considered several options. It was really that email correspondence between the board members that we're referring to there. Um, the first, A, B, and C, were all discussed um, by the members, and then Councillor Shenton suggested uh, option D, and it was really that in, in turn, that, that discussion that we're talking about there between members or the correspondence between members. Of course, it falls to members now to discuss those items and agree as a board if, if they so wish to at this meeting. That's really all that was referring to. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the explanation, Oliver. Yes, Karen. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I really obviously uh, in, in working with Councillor Page and, and speaking to councillors um, <clears throat> in, 
in Reading, um, he's certainly presented most of the um, really relevant points, uh, item C, uh, about the non-booked appointments uh, being something that, that does frequently, again, come up. Uh, but uh, the only other thing I would reiterate uh, in item A of section 5.13, about the uh, digital exclusion and translations into other languages, which I feel is extremely, extremely important, living on a street where many, many languages are spoken myself. But it is also to look at how we uh, can better market or, or ensure that areas where there is, uh, there's areas of greater deprivation and areas where the service has not been picked up as much. And that, to me, is another element that we really need to consider because uh, digital exclusion just doesn't uh, sit down there and answer all the woes of areas where there are uh, greater deprivation, where it isn't being picked up as much. So that is another factor there. Uh, and, you know, just, just bearing in mind, I don't want the board just to think, oh, let's just do a couple language translations and it's all done. Uh, that's not, not, not really the case. And I think we could all benefit from ensuring uh, that in each of our, each of our councils and areas where, where there are greater deprivation, that we're bringing all of them along with the success of our individual uh, councils. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd... Dorothy, oh. it would help us um, if, if the, the point about particularly the, the limited opening hours, um, if there was a clear view from Bracknell and Wokingham about that, because uh, um, clearly we've expressed a, um, a view, but I understand our contrary view, so it would be helpful just to have that formally um, on the record. Um, would you like to speak to that, Damien, at all? I see no problem with getting that over because at this point in time, I can assure you that our only problem, and I know that Reading will have this, is we don't want queues, and I mean queues, occurring when we are showing that we are running it to a satisfactory, very satisfactory. It's just getting the message for those who cannot attend that we can find ways of. But uh, all in all, I find that when speaking to people, people are more pleased that it is there because of the, where the site is, and particularly with regards to Reading now, if it goes ahead with some of the planning issues that you have coming up, you could have, we, won't, we don't want a free-for-all from across the road even uh, with regards to traffic. And I'm sure Wokingham have the same views. It, it works very well. Yes, Damien. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, just to say that uh, currently in Bracknell, obviously the um, statistics that we've got from the user survey are very strong uh, in terms of supporting the booking system. Uh, it has certainly eased the traffic congestion that we've had previously around the site. Um, uh, and uh, slots are readily available for um, the residents to either book online or through our customer contact centre. Um, so uh, I think it works well as it is. Yes. Um, <coughs> the last thing that I think Wilkingham would want to see is, is queues rebuilding at uh, your respective centres because we don't actually have a physical centre as such. Um, I, I fully get the point that having a, if you like, one day or two days a week that could be a free-for-all um, could then reintroduce those queues. Um, people would start to say, well, why would I go on Wednesday if I can go on Monday and don't have to book? Um, I, on, on the whole, I think the system is working well as it is, and uh, we don't tend to get complaints too much. We're, th the major complaint, that the w I've had one complaint directly to me about a gentleman who actually, uh, he booked, he was quite happy with booking, but he made, he made the error of going on the day before he had booked. And he admitted it was his fault, but he was turned away. And as he was turned away, there was no one there at the area he wanted to go to. Uh, and that's more the kind of complaint that we get uh, than, than actually requests for days with no, with no appointments. Any other questions? I'll just sum up then that as far as Bracknell, we find this, oh, sorry, Wokingham? Yeah, I just wanted to add a, a little bit to what uh, Ian 
Ian said at the end, would it be possible to have a little bit more flexibility from the people on the reception? So if somebody turns up day early by mistake and the area that they want to go to is empty, that they're actually let in? Because that would be the most sensible thing to do than send them away and ask them to come back again. Thank you, Clive. Um, yes, so um, in many ways, um, staff use their discretion when deciding whether to let residents in where the booking's not quite right. Um, they do show um, some flexibility, um, but yeah, like I say, they, they tend to use their own judgment about what is appropriate and what isn't, um, but I'm sure we can issue more guidance to them if we need to. Yes, Oliver. Chairman, thank you. If I may, just, just one thing. I think that the package of of, of options that we've looked at here is really to try and find a way to make the system work as best as possible. Now, what I think we're all saying, but not specifically saying, is that the booking system works if people book and if people turn up broadly at the time they've booked, and in fact at the time they've booked. However, I would just reiterate what Sarah said really in response to general points all of you are making, which is that it's never, it's never not been flexible, it's never been as flexible as some people would like, but I think so long as we can bend rather than break perhaps the system, I think it'll all, it'll work. Uh, but the general point is the package of items that you've asked us to consider here or to bring into place really is to make sure the system works as best as possible in terms of the way we communicate it, the way it operates, um, and how we receive people, which we still want, as we've always wanted at the sites, to be excellent and for people to go away thinking they've received a good service. Thank you, Chairman. Funny enough, Oliver, I just wrote down the word flexibility in front of me. And it is the progress of the, the time and how we pr pr go forward and the sites, because the sites opposite as they change or wh when we change the site itself and the working operations of it. Because I gather that this moment in time, most of Wokingham's trucks come in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then are transferred on Thursday, Friday to Reading. So it's again, it is how the, pla the pattern of the ta table works. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, in front of us, we're the, we do have a paper, and having clarified to you, Tony, what the reasoning for the wording, and I'm sure we will take that forward. Can I take it and move the agreed recommendations that are on there? Any? Chair? Yes, I could. Yes, Karen. Um, yes, I, I would just like it uh, clarified that not only uh, the the digital exclusion number, uh, but it's also enhanced marketing really towards areas where we're not getting the word out. Um, so there is there's definitely some clarification I would like there, and <coughs> just just pointing out I I think that that flexibility can really be uh, well brought in because. We've got increased improvements in our meet and greet statistics too. So, so we are getting a friendlier and more welcoming service. I know that Sarah and Oliver have also produced slides that have, have proven that, that they're not being turned away. So yeah, thank you. No, not at all. The more we put into this, the better we get. Did you want to say anything? To, yes. One other point. Can we have a report back, not obviously to the no, next, uh, but in terms particularly of A and B, um, <coughs> The, uh, if we could have a report back uh, later this year on, on how that's being uh, taken forward, that would be um, um, helpful to all of us, I think. I was going to myself state with regards to the recommendations that this isn't something we just put to the one side. It should, we need to keep continually taking it on board. Yes, Alan. Chairman, it occurs to me that actually, uh, can, just for my purposes, if nothing else, but perhaps sure for members as well, are we agreeing that we will um, support the inclusion of questions to non-users in the corporate, next corporate um, surveys, such that that can be offered? The reason for mentioning that is, is that that would be a natural, the results of those would be a natural point at which to report back to the board and say, this is what we found here and this is what we found in, in across the other three councils. Damien? Um, I'm not sure that's something that we can agree uh, at Bracknell in this board because it's a much wider 
survey uh, than, than just on uh, waste users, but it's certainly something we can raise with um, whoever, whoever manages it, the executive, uh, to see whether they would uh, include those questions. But yeah, we will do that. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, recommendations 2.1 to 2.4, we will take with the alterations as such, and it will be coming back to us at different stages, okay? Thank you. Yes, we're on the statistics. Right, would you like to continue? Uh, yes, so, um, yeah, as you say, the next section on the report is about the performance statistics. Um, so I've presented the recycling rates in the report for April through to November, um, and you will notice that for all three councils, the recycling rates are still below where they were this time last year. Um, however, towards the end of last year, there were some areas where it looked like tonnages were starting to recover a bit, um, so particularly garden waste tons and mixed dry recycling. Um, there are a lot of factors that are probably affecting recycling rates and tonnages at the moment and comparisons with previous years. Um, so we will continue to monitor those um, and also keep an eye on any sort of national pieces of work looking at various trends and things um, that are going on. Um, Yes, are there any questions on statistics? The garden waste, is, I'm pleased, is still moving along quite well. Yes. Very wet and frozen sometimes. Um, yeah, um, the section after that, I think, was about the bag splitting at the recycling centre um, for general waste. Um, so at the last meeting, officers proposed that we would restart that activity at the recycling centres um, following its suspension um, during COVID. Um, at that meeting, members asked um, if there was a net cost associated with that activity and asked us to review the costs. Um, so you will now see that there's a full breakdown of costs within the report. Um, and overall, there is a net cost per year of about £40,000 associated with the bag splitting. Um, so as a result, we are not planning to recommence the activity in the form that it was previously um, undertaken in. Um, but if there is an option that we can look at, um, which is perhaps more financially viable, we will bring that back to a further meeting as a proposal for you to review, if that sounds okay. Any questions to that? Frank, you're okay? Yes. Um, okay, um, the next point, I've forgotten what it is. <laughs> service, delivery. <laughs> service delivery plans. Um, yeah, so that's just a quick point to note that um, we plan to review that part of the contract um, with FCC, the contractor, um, just to make sure that the text within the contract still reflects um, our current and agreed um, practices at the sites. Um, we will put together a report um, with regards to proposed amendments and then we will bring that back to you at the April meeting so that you can review these amendments and hopefully agree them. Um, FCC will also be taking those, these amendments to their board to check that they are happy with them. Any questions? No. Moving on. Okay, um, the next one is just a quick point to note as well. Um, so it just relates to the fire that we experienced at the Small Mead site on the 28th of November. Um, so FCC were able to successfully manage the fire um, at the site. Um, the exact cause of the fire is not known, but suspected to be related to a battery. Um, therefore, um, work is underway to continue to make residents aware of the issues around batteries and the correct disposal routes. And I suspect Monica might touch on that as well um, in the communication section later on. Are there any questions about the I'm hoping, Monica, because I am pleased with what Monica, the design element of that and getting the message out. I don't know if you want to, but it, it is important because we've had vehicles it's not just the sites, it's the vehicles themselves and how dangerous that can be. 
Thank you. Continue. Okay, um, and the only other section from me is about compost. Um, so you will be aware that we ran our community compost scheme between April and October of last year. Um, as of now, about 1,400 bags of compost have been given to local community groups. Um, so these were either picked up by the community groups from the recycling centre or some were delivered by FCC and by Suez. Um, in return for receiving the compost, the community groups have been providing us with evidence of the sorts of things they've been doing with the compost in order to promote um, local community action and recycling. Um, and Monica has put some examples of that um, in the appendix to the report. Um, in particular, you will note that a couple of um, the projects we supported were featured in um, news reports on the television. Um, so overall, it was quite a positive project, um, but we do still have quite a lot of bags left over from that project that weren't allocated out. Um, so as a result, we are proposing to relaunch the scheme in, in the spring um, when there might be a bit more demand for compost. Um, there were also um, some bags that were allocated um, last year but were never collected by the community groups. So if we do relaunch the scheme, we would also propose to go back to those groups and see if they still require the compost. Um, any questions on compost? Not so much a question, but a thank you, because um, I have received some um, personal where they were really pleased when they came down. And, and what was nice, that the FCC guys helped them as well to load the vehicle or the vehicles. That, and I think that is one of the problems as well for the community that want them, whether they got transportation. It's something we, you know, we could look at on that one. Yes, thank you. Moving along, did you want to come in now? <laughs> Can I move on to communications? Yeah. Um, so as Sarah just mentioned and board uh, report uh, mentioned about fires, unfortunately, yeah, we, we had a, a, a few occasions that uh, fire uh, started at the facilities, but also it happened to the council vehicles as well, which naturally caused uh, uh, increase and in focus of the communications to residents uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 explain the the, the problem and um, the risk of incorrectly. Uh, disposed of uh, batteries, um, which we have done using obviously all of our channels and supported by the council channels as well. Um, in addition, uh, we uh, hosted TV Cruise twice, um, which produced brilliant reports uh, featured in the uh, both BBC um, original news and ITV Meriden as well, uh, which uh, from what I understand was a very uh, uh, really well received uh, and uh, reached uh, quite good number of, of uh, residents. Uh, so all of our facilities been mentioned, officers took part and, and uh, contractor as well um, provided a very good uh, uh, comms uh, on, on that point um, to help us to support it. We know as well that the vapes is becoming a growing problem as well. Uh, some currently working with recycle your trickles uh, to clear out the messages because they are quite complicated uh, as a general as a fairly new stream of, 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 of uh, items, uh, so to get it right, uh, I want to make sure that we're in line with the national uh, guidance uh, on that subject, so as soon as this is going to be available, it will be shared uh, both with obviously council teams as, as well with the uh, uh, general public. Um, Okay, moving on to the next items. Um, we uh, wanted to note uh, that the RF3 supported a new study uh, led by University of Reading. Um, it was related to the um, recycling of food packaging. Um, so at the moment is the, uh, the phase of the workshop, so, so we're hoping that we will receive some findings. It'll be interesting to see what the uh, new audience, uh, so children aged uh, seven to 11, think about how to recycle food packaging. So we're hoping that we'll receive some uh, results and findings uh, on that. Um, uh, obviously, very recently, uh, pre-Christmas period, uh, uh, we uh, put a lot of focus on the festive communications uh, that we've been shared uh, using our newsletters, but also social media. This time around, we also prepared some activities uh, for schools that we shared with the local schools as well um, that I attached. Um, um, 
in terms of the advertising, uh, we have the space in the council magazines uh, that is being distributed to residents. Uh, so um, I believe uh, this time we uh, used uh, adverts on the food waste uh, prevention. Um, I think it, would be qu it was quite helpful. I had the Christmas and obviously in general cost of living crisis and, and the issues around that subject. So I think focus on, on, on helping residents to reduce spendings, uh, it's quite appreciated. Um, moving along, uh, mm, on many occasions we sharing, uh, and Sarah's particularly sharing uh, contamination uh, um, reports uh, to officers and members as well. Um, so we wanted to uh, present it a bit more visual, um, present it in a more visual way. Uh, so I attached an appendix for a, a suggestion, obviously it's not finished, uh, contamination infographic that we would like to use going forward to uh, uh, to help uh, both internally but also externally understand the issue of contamination and put the focus on what, what are the, the, the key items that they are should not be there, but also what is the actual results of the contamination, how it affects the uh, uh, sorting quality of our recyclables, but also how it impacts the environment, um, unnecessary transport, uh, um, um, effectiveness of facilities, we see how many hours are being wasted because of processing waste that shouldn't be there in the first place and obviously how much it costs. Uh, so I would welcome some feedback. This obviously by no means is not finished, can be edited uh, as, as we wanted, but I think you know having th something in visual way would help us understand the problem better and then we can find the better actions uh, to, to tackle this pro problem. Um, um, I wanted to note that in 518, uh, our quite successful public tours that we always uh, provided uh, at material recycling facility. This has been suspended um, during the COVID, uh, which uh, now we are able to uh, reintroduce the recommend, so which is really a um, uh, good thing, because they're always uh, coming with a brilliant feedback, and uh, we're happy that a uh, contractor is able to support us on, on delivering these tours. Uh, so this is a purely uh, tours that they, we uh, welcome organizations or groups that they're able to uh, bring uh, at least 15 people together at the same time. Uh, in addition to that, uh, members, some of the members definitely would recall um, the tours that we are uh, organizing for the public individually that we trying to, uh, to, to uh, compress in a week, uh, usually coincides with recycle week. So I'm hoping that now we are clear of, of the COVID uh, rules, uh, safety rules, we might be able to offer this year as well. Uh, but by all means, uh, any organizations that are keen to visit the facilities uh, are welcome to um, um, fill the form at the website and uh, we should be able to allocate um, the visit. Um, I have a quick section on kind of uh, a summary of our online uh, tools that we are reaching the residents. Obviously, it's been lots of talk about the digital exclusion, <coughs> however, uh, uh, from marketing point of view, it is a, a far-reaching tools and very low cost in terms of the uh, uh, cost, obviously. Uh, so uh, we are using a variety of channels uh, that are free, uh, that are supportive towards the council on channels as well. Our social media uh, community is, 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 is growing and it's uh, quite engaging. Uh, so I would very much uh, like us to continue with it and uh, as we're doing this uh, very frequently engaging with public <laughs> on uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter as well. Um, we have uh, uh, our own newsletter uh, that it's been um, uh, subscribers are derived from the booking system uh, which is growing uh, ever so. Uh, it's been introduced uh, at the moment almost 50,000 subscribers. Uh, so it's a huge, a huge number. Uh, of people who are genuinely interested, genuinely users, so it, it, and it's quite engaging uh, 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 audience, I would say, uh, as we are receiving a very high, almost 50% opening rate, which is extremely high for the this sort of uh, type of communications. Uh, so uh, we're trying to make sure that we issue at least once, if not more often, a month, uh, some useful uh, information, whether it's related to our services or uh, our joint uh, projects, um, uh, to just name a few, so uh, very useful thing um, that we uh, we should uh, bear in mind that, that we're having. And obviously beginning of the year we'll be looking at the new projects, uh, uh, on top of that it's already been discussed today, which obviously will be uh, uh, taking a, a priority, but just li like to uh, put a, a kind of a focus on a, on a couple items uh, here. 
um, members are aware of the Recyclopedia app that we are we having. Uh, it's been in use for over four years. So I think it's a good time to, to review it. Uh, and the reason for that is obviously just see uh, whether it is something we would like to continue, whether the app is, is still a useful thing. And again, in the context of digital exclusion, uh, I do not want to keep, uh, keep repeating myself, but uh, again, uh, it is some, it is a future in, in terms of you know the way um, way communicate way we can communicate and deliver information to public. Um, uh, I do believe that the recyclopedia is, is very useful. It, it gets uh, uh, a very um, useful informa information, but also obviously public can search what can be recycled. No, uh, not. Uh, it allows us to uh, provide a kind of gateway to, to the council services, uh, but uh, it's no harm to, to check whether it's something else out there, a potentially identified app that we might would like to consider. So uh, I would be um, making a, um, a contact with uh, each council teams and members uh, on that point uh, to make sure uh, that we are happy to stay with what we got or potentially move into uh, alternative uh, of, uh, app. Um, uh, coming back to the previous user satisfaction survey, um, one of the points that's been raised it was uh, uh, allowing our, um, improvement of our maps. Uh, so uh, we are waiting for a bit of the better signage to, uh, uh, from the contractor. But on top of it, I would like to uh, see us going uh, into uh, um, a bit more innovative way of getting people engaged with the uh, facilities. Uh, so it's an option to provide a virtual tour as a 360 <coughs> degrees images of the facilities that we will be able to uh, pinpoint exactly what's happening and what services we're having. We could overlay uh, lots of information on it um, that I'm hoping that it would help people uh, just find out more information and feel a bit more comfortable with uh, how to recycle at the site. Uh, obviously, having such a uh, good tools like even our newsletter is obviously a booking system when every day um, people booking and receive some uh, confirmation email, we can obviously share that link to that tours with uh, with the side users. Uh, so that uh, should be helpful in that sense. Uh, but also, uh, what's quite uh, interesting to note, uh, obviously these images could be available at the uh, Google search as well. Um, and uh, from looking at our Google business page, uh, it is uh, a place where residents do go first when they are getting to the facility. So they either obviously looking for locations, directions, or phone number, basically. So uh, just uh, from top of my head, uh, we're talking about 50,000 views a month each site, uh, which is quite a significant number, uh, how people are finding information about us. And obviously they can publicly put, put reviews, comments, ask questions. So uh, this is something definitely I would like to look at this year to make sure that the, our Google business page <coughs> looks uh, are really good in, in a sense that uh, people will find information uh, if they're looking for it uh, just from that first point of, of the search. Um, and hopefully as well it will help the office team to uh, reduce some potentially unnecessary calls. Um, and the last uh, item on, on my uh, um, report, um, I, had a, 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 I would like to see whether we would be uh, having appetites to some anti-litter campaign uh, in terms of uh, looking at the partnership-wide campaign. Uh, it is something that we haven't uh, done before. Uh, littering has not been uh, uh, something that uh, kind of uh, uh, been tackled practically in terms of especially in marketing, a part of, you know, obviously helping to understand public that this is a, uh, this is the behavior that we not accept. Uh, so uh, I would uh, be keen to send some more information on that with the, to the waste uh, teams and the councillors as well to see how would they feel about um, uh, organizing the uh, campaign that uh, utilize a national app that incentivize the litter picker and hopefully, you know, with some associated uh, uh, comes with that, we will be able to uh, to uh, tackle a problem that shouldn't be there in the first place, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 from what I understand, it, it is something that uh, littering it is listed as a as a one of the measuring environmental acts. So having something done in that subject could put us in a good position in terms of uh, uh, securing some some potential funding for the councils in the future.
Yeah, and welcome any questions. Well, first of all, Monica, welcome back. And I'm sure you've missed us as we've missed yes, you. Yes, I, I did. <laughs> I have. Thank yes. you so much. No, having said that, um, the subject of uh, litter pick and that, keep Britain tidy, I think most of the councils work on that, but it's something we could all be putting forward. Another thought I had was with the schools, um, they, uh, we had the environment seminar at uh, Garth Hill School, and that went down very well on climate change, but those are the sort of things going out to the schools, and I find that with Donna Cox and myself, we could work with you as well and let you know what we are doing in the schools, talking to them. And you'd be surprised how many young persons ask us about the food waste and what we make of it and where do we take it. And those sort of things, that was why when I arranged for officers, uh, councillors just recently of, our, uh, of Bracknell Forest, they were they were taken back. It's, it's, it's educating. It is getting the word out there. And one picture can say a thousand words. Mm. And I've always said that part. Any other? Yes, Karen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would just like to echo your uh, sentiments in regards to Section 5.60 about the uh, anti-litter campaign and the uh, proposal of a partnership-wide uh, uh, approach to that, I would very much uh, second and welcome that. Um, as Mr. Edwards knows, uh, you know, litter is, litter is an issue that, that is, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of resurfaced, you know, over the holidays and all that other stuff as we get our, our, our crews back, back on order. But uh, in conjunction with keep Britain Tidy, uh, I've asked our officers uh, at the council to come up with a series of, of um, incentives and everything and advising uh, within Reading, but I would very much like to see that clicked in, obviously, with you, and I do know that John will be getting to you, but also uh, wider. So I'm very much in favor of that. And also to lie to, to say in Section 5.46, the study that was done by the University of Reading was, uh, happened to be one of... Uh, Councillor Page is in my constituents, so that had done that. So thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, I don't know uh, exactly what uh, Reading and Bracknell do, but we uh, have in Wokingham an, an active Adopt a Street program. Yes. Um, and uh, they're all volunteers. They receive plastic waste bags from the council, litter pickers from the council, and a high vis vest. Uh, and then after that, it kind of runs itself. And, and maybe there's some, something we can build on that. I don't know if, if uh, the other two authorities actually have something similar ongoing at the moment. We actually have a pa the parishes get together and have a collection as well. So it's, it is out there. Yes, and Reading has the Red Adopt Your Street, so it's very similar to the early Adopt Your Street. Um, volunteers group so this is certainly something that I would like to reach out to groups as well because uh, yeah, we, we can't tackle it uh, one person can't do it so so the, 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 the army of volunteers which are already out there yeah. it's, it's critical to it's, the, uh, it's joining up all the dots as we put yeah. it okay on a separate issue um, on the issue of the app I've actually I have one one correspondent who's who's very keen on <coughs> talking about asking questions about uh, waste and recycling repeatedly my inbox is rarely <laughs> without an email from him um, and he has taken on board the recycle now app and he really is enthusing about that so I don't know how the the RE3 Cyclopedia app compares to Recycle Now, but um, so, so Recycle Now do not have an app. It, it is a waste search. Uh, so it's a, it's a s uh, recycling locator, as they calling it. It it doesn't work as the app. So that's the the main difference. But uh, certainly they are uh, the option to if we potentially decide to not carry on with the our app, but look for the other alternatives. Uh, we can incorporate recycling lo locator a bit in prominent place than we're having at the moment because obviously at the moment these two things competing with each other recyclopedia is purely targeted and tailored to our residents and the information uh, which is there it's it's uh, uh, our own uh, whereas the recycling locator works on the national basis um, but uh, 
I will take that point and I will um, see and how we can incorporate uh, recycling at Kaker a bit more. Any other input? Just one observation, something that I know it's not so much so litter, but vapes. They have become a, and I know my uh, Councillor Harrison, you had the problems of. Um, Underage sales as well. Yes, underage sales and that. It's quite. Have you mentioned vapes yet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so as I said, like it, it is a. a kind of something that we should call as a new separate stream because uh, disposal of it, it's, it's very tricky. There are different types of vapes. Uh, they, they got removable batteries, some of them <coughs> do not. Uh, and how to actually dispose it. Uh, all in on the conclusion is they, they should not go into the r residual bin. Uh, and definitely they can't be recycled unless it's as a small electrical. Uh, so it is a growing problem. Uh, it, it's very little information about that and it's, uh, and they are everywhere. <laughs> Sadly, as you can, as if you go, if you walk and um, doing any walks, what you can see is the packaging and uh, uh, vapes everywhere. Uh, what's worrying as well is obviously a, a, a word um, is it disposable, uh, which is written all over it, which suggests for everyone once you use it, you can just put it into the bin, and. Uh, Unfortunately, this should not happen, but uh, it, it is a problem that nationally, I think, uh, the groups are trying to, to find a way of, of doing it. Uh, at the recycling center, we're going to put a, a mini small beans um, as a, to show public this is a separate stream. Uh, but this obviously this is a small step. We're talking about something that is disposed on a go. Uh, that's why I think that anti-littering campaign should help. Uh, the one that I got in mind potentially has some sort of, you know, the, the small targeted mini campaigns in within that uh, that are focusing on the different type of streams, whether it's uh, vapes, as you mentioned, whether it's a, uh, a, an other um, type of the quite often disposed uh, of items. Uh, so, um, yeah, please allow me to, to put all of the information and, and send it around to, to you and uh, hopefully we'll get some consensus. I would like to really see, as, as uh, Councillor Ron mentioned, to making this a bit of a um, barrel white to, to, to uh, partnership white to make it a bit more effective. Yes, Councillor Harrison. Yeah, speaking of addictive substances, our um, brain bottle banks are very popular and people do go to the supermarket and collect up their weekly usage and, and put the bottles in there quite often rather than put it in their general waste. So I was wondering, given the risks of uh, vapes and batteries and things like that being put in the normal waste or in the recycling mm -hmm. waste and the, the problems with those catching fire as well and the, the kind of outlier risks there we've got to our trucks and to our staff, would it be better if we had some bring the banks where people could put small electricals, anything disposable or that's broken, that's got rechargeable batteries in it, like toothbrushes and so on, and vapes and that sort of thing, because I really can't see that people are going to book to go into the household waste recycling centre on a weekly basis to get rid of a few vapes and batteries for their domestic appliances. Would it be worthwhile looking at getting bring the banks available at our regular sites, especially yes. as we cut those down by not having as many bottle banks because we're mixing those now? This is very true, and um, I don't want to put Sarah on the spot here, but it's something that we would potentially discuss. Yeah, Sarah, maybe you would like to. Damien, um, uh, we also um, have our um, twice annual. Um, we uh, deposit schemes, so um, they're very successful, very popular, um, based at the uh, Athletics Track car park twice a year, so March and September, I think. Um, and uh, we can include um, sort of vape information in that publicity as well, if that's helpful. Uh, we could do a poster part on that, because I attend those, and yeah. they are very well attended. We're going to collection them. Um, Chair, yeah, in, in Reading, actually, what we have is, is a separate policy wherein you can put your we and your small batteries and everything in a separate bag, and that's collected. What we don't have uh, for our we is necessarily a large enough uh, capacity on our vehicles to always uh, collect all of them, so we find that very quickly we can't pick up the we. 
uh, towards the end of a towards the end of a round. Uh, but that's something worth looking. Um, to your point, I would like a little bit of feedback though about uh, collection banks, because I have been led to understand that that if you've got a collection bank like that, sometimes we go poof and we've got fires with those. So before I would sit down there and say, let's rock on with that kind of idea, I, I'd really like some understanding as to whether it's actually a, a safe idea. Yes, this is the exactly why I kind of wanted to, Sarah to, to, to speak on that point, because yes, so internal so discussion uh, uh, concluded that uh, electrical banks, we banks, uh, it's pose a quite a higher risk of potential fire. Uh, people do sometimes using those banks for not necessarily appropriate ways or not in the right ways, as, as we know. Uh, so as safe it is with textiles, uh, bottle banks, the uh, electrical banks are not always a safe idea. Um, so uh, we would be contemplating probably to find some, some other solutions. Thank you. Did you want to put in on it, Oliver, or do you think it's covered? I think that's a really good point. There is a fire risk. We we looked at whether or not we could collect batteries in council offices and libraries and so on and so forth. But of course, that's the last place we want to be having a fire. Well, it's not the last place, but it's one of the last places we want to have a fire. Um, they do. That's right. I think I think where I'm coming to, councillor, is that is that we'll do some research with the contractor, see what other people are doing around the country, and we'll bring a report back to the board for your consideration. Well, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there any consistency of looking at soft plastic? Because uh, we seem to be reliant upon supermarkets with their collection points, and they are of variable quality, sometimes hidden away in the back of the store, sometimes very obvious at the front. Um, one of my local supermarkets actually has, uses one of their trolleys that they use to bring stock out onto the shop floor. And of course, that has a high cage basically and no one uh, in a wheelchair could access it so we have this variable quality of supermarket collection points for soft plastic is it something that we could look at as, as, a, as an operation maybe again maybe a brink bank or, or something like that Oliver Jim thank you yeah I think that's a really good point we will look into soft plastics and indeed we are looking into soft plastics you may be aware already councillors that Soft plastics is one of the second phase of materials that councils will be required through the New Environment <coughs> Act to collect. At the moment, the date for that looks like something around 2026, although that may be pushed back because a lot of the dates are kind of trending backwards. Um, the slight difficulty, and this, this goes back to the conversation around glass, really, the slight difficulty is, of course, is that the way that the Environment Act is intended to work out is for uh, councils to be funded through extended producer responsibility so that people putting that, those products on the market will have to pay for their collection and their recycling, which, of course, at the moment, the collection side and, the re and a large part of the recycling side comes out of taxpayers' pocket directly through their taxes. Um, in order for us to do a, a, a collection and processing of soft plastics in particular, there's two things that need to happen. One, obviously, we would probably want that funding stream to be turned on so that we're, we're having the funding for any additional collection and processing and so on and so forth. So that's one thing. And that funding stream is not yet turned on, although we, we expect an announcement imminently. And the second thing is for there to be an Im a maturing market for those materials so that we know when we tell our residents we're now going to collect this, that it will definitely be recycled. You will all remember, I'm sure prior to the councils being able to collect pots, tubs and trays, that was always our refrain. It was, well, we don't know we can send this somewhere and make sure it's going to be recycled. Now, we, we with the contractor, we've managed to sort that out. And that's still not the position for lots of councils that are not collecting pots, tubs and trays. Um, so we've managed to find a, a secure market for those things, it's recycled in the UK. I think we would probably want the same situation for soft plastics. So the answer is definitely yes. But I think as a group of three councils, we will want to just make sure that we're not, one, putting ourselves at a financial detriment from going particularly early on this when we know the legislation won't make us to do that. And two, we want to know that we've got a secure market somewhere. We're definitely going to be able to send it and, and know our residents will 
will trust us when we say we're recycling it. So again, similar answer, I suppose. Let's keep an eye on that, and, and we'll make sure that we, we keep briefing the board as, as we go. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I should be moving us on a bit quicker than this. But having said that, I do, do think this progress report was important today because not only stating what we feel for the future with regards to uh, um, going into these sites, but also how we can get the communication out there of what is good, what should be happening, and how we can go forward in making climate change and collection one of our priorities. Well, not one definitely a priority so therefore taking on board all the recommendations that are placed before us but also the alterations that we i'm sure hannah's got can i take it that we are in agreement to the recommend uh, to that and then we move on yep everyone's happy right okay therefore it's agenda items and exclusion of press uh, public and press and that does not mean that you can get up and go off everyone um, agenda right, uh, because it, because that agenda item eight includes the likely disclosure of exempt information, so we will be moving into the private section to discuss this item. May I therefore move that pursuant to regulation four of the local authorities executive arrangements access to information regulations 2012 and having regard to the public interest, members of the public and press be excluded from the meeting for the con consideration of item I think it's eight and nine on this one, which in involves the likely disclosure of exempt information under the following category of sh Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1973. Uh, two, three, information related to the financial and business affairs of the, any particular person, including the authority holding that information. That is seconded by all, I'm sure. Yes, okay. Thank you. Does any member oppose moving into the private section? Nope. Right. Democratic citizens, please can you close the public part of the meeting and to confirm that when live broadcast is ended, please would all virtual parties stay in the meeting while this is done. Esther, can you confirm when we're no longer streaming, please? <laughs>